Hey everybody, today Rado runs down the month of December 2019, and oh, what a month it was! What a gaming year it was, and what a gaming decade it has been! We are here at the end of the line, folks, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time today giving you an idea of what games Jen and I enjoyed at the uh, table over the last four weeks, as I always do at the end of the month. And as always, this will be a countdown, starting with our least favorite and ending with the game of the month, which, if you You've already seen my top 10 games of the year I did last week. Well, my top, uh, my number one of the month might not come as too much of a surprise, but we'll save that for the end because it is time to start counting down these 18 games. Starting with number 18, Hansa Teutonica, which is well, how fortunate that I should end the decade uh, by covering a game that came out a decade ago. A 10-year-old game, a modern masterpiece from designer Andreas Stedding that to this day is still so widely loved. And I have to admit, we, Jen and I, we played this kind of euro area control game back when it first came out a decade ago. And at that point, the two-player rules were so weird, for lack of a better term, it just didn't work for us. But... Ever since then, people have been telling me, you gotta try the new updated Hansa Teutonica rules that they changed the core uh, two-player variant. And so we finally broke down, uh, mostly because it got so many thumbs on my request list, and we gave it a try this month. Uh, thanks to Kevin for getting me his copy of the game so we could give it a go. And I gotta say, we were super impressed. I can see why this is such a beloved, eternally uh, popular Euro game, because the design here is brilliant. It is an area control game, but the interesting thing about it is every time I push my way into an area that you've already kind of, you know, uh, got your hooks into, and I end up kicking you out, it's not that aggressive because I end up having to pay more to kick you out than I would be just trying to pursue my own stuff, and I end up giving you a really huge benefit that you could flip to get even further ahead elsewhere. So, we like the core game, but that said, as nice as the two-player rules were, the game board still felt a little too wide open. I understand that if you play the two-player rules with the Britain map that came out in subsequent years, that fixes a lot of the problems. But while I can totally see why Hansi Tanya is so well-loved as a four-player game, as a two-player game, it's good, but there are certainly other games I would play above it, so that's why it comes in at number 18. Then we move on to number 17, Terra Mara. And quite frankly, this should be a top five. This could have been a top ten of the year. This is such an amazingly fresh take on worker placement because it is a Stone Age era game where we're trying to, you know, do right by our clans or tribes or what have you by sending workers out to gather resources to build ancient Stone Age technologies. It'll give us special powers and all that kind of stuff. The thing that makes it interesting is the board is actually a uh, comprised of a bunch of rows that represent moving further in time, making more breakthroughs in technology. Each one of these rows has a bunch of worker placement spots on it. And at the beginning of the game, you have to start on the top row, but you might not get what you want there. It might be blocked by somebody else. And you can see, oh, uh, 20 years from now or 30 years, you know, further down on the row is the perfect action I need to do. And you can place your workers there. You can basically make a Stone Age scientific breakthrough and um, put your worker down, you know, two, three, four rows in the future. And so you can get really big paydays. They'll give you a lot of stuff because at the beginning of the game, our technology isn't that great. We don't get that much. Here's the trick though. Once I send a worker to one of those future rounds, or the spaces where normally we activate in the future round, I won't see that worker again until the end of that future round. So that is a brilliant trade-off. It is so smart. And I would love to see this idea brought into other worker placement games. Because as much as I loved it, you know, that whole trade-off of, oh, do I mind give it, saying goodbye to this worker and I don't have very many workers for three rounds so I can get what I need right now? The bird in the hand, two in the bush is strong here. It's so good. But my problem is, and the reason I passed on covering the game originally is, one of the things you can advance your Stone Age tribe in is the art of warfare and military. And 
Uh, while one of the things is cool, it gives you more flexibility about where you can put your workers. You can also use that military just to directly steal from other players, which is, ugh, why is that here? But ultimately, I'd heard so much good about this game, I decided to try it anyway, that maybe we'd be able to you know, make our peace with the military. And it turns out, yes, there's too much military for our taste. The core gameplay is brilliant. I would love a Caravare version of this, because it might have made my top 10 of the year. But as it is, it comes in at number 17, Terramara. Then we've got number 16, The Colors of Paris, which is a uh, very, very cool, another cool worker placement game. The trick here is every round we're putting workers on the board to gather paints so that we can paint paintings. And, uh, and get special powers and stuff like that. And the interesting thing is the board itself, the worker placement board, at the beginning of every round rotates. And that changes the layout of where we can send workers and what actions we can do. Uh, some rounds, oh, an action I really need isn't going to be available at all. I can see that next round. I can't get yellow paints. I better get them now. Or if I wait a little while, there'll be ample opportunities to get yellow paints or to mix paints or whatever it is you might want to do, all the different worker placement spots. And so the availability of different actions is constantly constantly in flux, and that's lovely. It's very, very cool. Um, that said, uh, and, and, and the core gameplay is is good. You know, gather resources to convert them into other resources, i.e. primary paints into secondary paints, so you can complete contracts and score points. It all works very nicely, but... Um, uh, uh, Ultimately, we were a little frustrated with the game. Specifically, the two-player scaling that is done in this game to tighten the board up really tightens it up. And there are often times where like, oh, um, you know, a thing that I would be able to do if I were playing with more players, even though there'd be more players, there would be ample opportunity to do this core action in a two-player game. Uh-uh, you just can't do it. You're going to have to wait. And... For us, it's really weird because we love it when games put the screws to us and really put us in tough situations where it's uh, hard to achieve what we want. Here, we felt the game was a little bit too draconian in the way it tightened up the board for a two-player, and I kind of found myself wishing, man, I wish I was playing this with more players because there would be so many more options, which is kind of counter. You expect, oh, a worker placement game with more players, there's fewer options, but there would be more. Um, I'm reminded of Lorenzo Il Magnifico did the same thing. It was a very clever worker placement game where for the two player, they tightened the board too much. And much more so, artificially constraining it in a way that wouldn't be with higher player counts. And that just didn't sit right with us. The core gameplay here is lovely. And like Hansa Teutonica, I think we would enjoy it a lot more at a higher player count. But for two, it was a little bit too tight. And that's why it comes in at number 16, The Colors of Paris. And then we have number 15, uh, Coralia, which is a very... It's, I was going to say lovely, and by lovely I mean beautiful. It is a gorgeous presentation. A dice drafting game where every round players are trying to grab very colorful dice that represent different areas of the coral reef we can dive and explore. And after we grab the dice, or if we take the dice, we roll them, and then we have to make a choice of, right, which of these dice am I going to use? Am I going to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, which, each die has two functions. The area that I can basically use the die as a worker placement, and also the type of action the die can do. And every round I'm going to have to pick one and then I'm going to have to give the rest to you. And I know I'm giving them to you, so uh, what am I going to do knowing what you can do in the future? There's actually a lot of really cool stuff here. And again, the, the gameplay is beautiful. It's a nice, solid gateway game. Very easy to teach. Uh, a lot of fun to play. But... For Jens and my taste, the luck factor was too high. That's why it comes in. I, I, I wouldn't mind if I were playing this as a straight gateway game with like my niece and nephew or something like that. But for me and Jen, we're more hardcore gamer geeks. And we found the luck of the draw, the cards you can draw when you do certain actions. Um, you know, just like it, it, was, it was too powerful, too swingy. And ultimately, we didn't feel that victory was defined as much by skill as we would have liked. It is still a skillful game. There are still interesting choices you can make. But for us, there was a little bit too much luck factor in an otherwise absolutely lovely, charming little dice drafting game, Coralia. Then we move on to, that was number 15. Number 14 is Square Meal. Now, this is actually a game that I got a prototype of uh, from the designer, Phil Dewberry. He's going to be taking it onto Kickstarter in January. And... Um, 
he wanted to know if I would cover for the Kickstarter, and I I, I said, I, I don't think so, I'm really kind of swamped, and he, but he went on ahead and sent me a copy anyway, just so we could give it a try, and Jen and I, we did uh, play this, and we did enjoy it, um, but I should say, this is not a paid preview. He sent me the prototype, I'm just covering it for the roundup. You can learn more uh, in the coming weeks when it goes on Kickstarter in January, but what is it? It's a, uh, a real-time card tableau building game. I, each player has a handful of cards that are full of different ingredients. They're two-sided. And uh, a player gets a target card indicating a kind of a polyomino tetra shape you have to build out of those cards. And go! It's real time and you're just trying to use these cards you've got, flip them over, lay them, you know, uh, lay them on top of each other, put them adjacent to each other, so that you can create a layout of the food stuff you need based on the objective card you got. And as soon as you can do that, boom, you score it and then you grab another one and you keep going until time runs out. And um, it's a sharp game. Very well considered, nice, fun, simple to teach, fast to play, and the only reason it doesn't rate higher for me, if it were Jen making this list, I think she would have rated it higher, because I don't know what it is about this game, I had a nearly impossible time coming to terms with actually being able to manipulate these cards. Uh, you know, I, I would try, and I would try, and I'd just like, ah, oh, I'd be so frustrated. There's no way I can make this particular card with the cards I've got. And I just, I've tried a million different ways. I cannot make the combinations. And Jen would say, let me take a look. And she'd figure it out in like 10 seconds. I'm like, ah, why am I having such a hard time seeing this? This game, I really struggled. Jen excelled at it. Um, and so, I mean, it was just like, she totally wiped the floor with me, which was surprising to both of us. Because normally I'm much better at pattern building than her. But there's something about this game that just, my brain would not work. But that's not the fault of the game. It's the fault of my brain. Um, and so, like I said, Jen enjoyed it quite a bit. I struggled with it. But I do feel like it's something I could almost use as a mental exercise to make my brain better. Uh, but anyway, it's it's a sharp, fun little game that you can teach anybody. Great gateway, um, you know, uh, fast, quick, clever. Number fourteen, square meal. Then we've got number thirteen, little town. And now this is another worker placement game uh, that does something very cool with worker placement. I know I often complain about why are there no cool new worker placement ideas. There are a bunch of them out there, and Little Town is definitely one of them. The idea is I place my worker out onto the board where everybody's going to be working in concert to make a lovely little town. And wherever I put my worker, I activate all the spaces next to him. So I can harvest resources, or if buildings have been built, I can trigger the power of those buildings. And the interesting thing is, since we're all building in the same little town, I can place my worker such that I will trigger your buildings. And that means I have to pay you for the benefit, but it becomes a very interesting game where, oh, I've got all the resources, I build the building I want to activate it, but boom, then you move in and activate it. And oh, okay, I can activate it, but now it's I can't activate it because I wanted to activate my building plus the the uh, pond that would give me the fish that I could pump into my fishery building, but you took that spot. You paid me for it. Next round, I'll be first player, I'll be able to do it, but now I've got to figure out something else to do. But hey, when you build stuff, I'll jump in um, to your neck of the woods. And the game works very nicely. Um, this idea of a worker placement board that is basically built by the players, where each potential space you can put your worker can trigger multiple actions, is really, really smart and well considered. And my only problem with the game, my only complaint is that the actual buildings that you're building, the special powers you get from them, are a little straightforward, a little standard. There are a handful of buildings you can build that really do cool, interesting stuff that makes the game blossom. There just aren't enough of them in the base game. Too much of the base game is really just devoted to harvest resources and convert those resources into points. I wanted to see more special rule-breaking powers with uh, more cool and interesting buildings you can build. Now, my hope is this game gets an expansion because it is so ripe with potential. Uh, but as it is right now, Little Town comes in at number 13 for the month. Then we have number 12, Fast Sloths. This is the latest game from Friedman Fries, the uh, design wunderkind, Mr. Um, Power Grid himself. And over the last few years, Friedman Freeze is always trying to push the envelope, coming up with really interesting new quirky designs. And Fast Sloth is no exception. This is a game where sloths, we, each player is a sloth, and we are racing to travel all around the jungle as fast as we can. 
but we're sloths, so we don't like to move on our own. And uh, this is a card drafting game where every turn I'm going to uh, you know, grab more cards to put in my hand, and I can play these cards to make the forest animals move around on the board. And if I move them close to me, I can hop on and catch a ride. The game proclaims itself, it's not a... Uh, it's a pickup and delivery game where you, the player, are what's being delivered. And I do think that's actually very clever. And the core gameplay works. There's so much variety because the game comes with, I forget, like 16 different animals. And they all have different powers and abilities. And every time you play, you can mix up a different group of animals. Although, interestingly, the developers have a series of... Uh, uh, special setups you can do. You have to read about them on Board Game Geek. I don't know why they weren't included in the manual. Kind of a shame. So that you can um, create like custom design boards with uh, you know different puzzles to solve as you try to manipulate these animals to get you where you need to go. So there's a lot to like here. The core gameplay is fun and fast and charming. This is Freedom and Freeze making a family-friendly gateway game. Again, this is uh, one I could definitely play with uh, my niece and nephew or you know like uh, board game muggles. My only problem with it the reason it doesn't come in higher is, again, the two-player. This is so often a problem with Friedemann, where he does really great designs that'll work great at higher player counts, and the two-player so-so. The problem here is, there's nothing done for scaling. The board is huge, and a big part of this game is, oh, I'm gonna make those elephants move over to me so that I can get them to throw me um, you know, across the forest to get where I need to go, except, oh, if I was playing with more players, you might mess with those ele elephants, because we're all kind of you know in the same space. In a two-player game, the board is so so huge that we will just never run into each other, and the game becomes very rote and mechanical. This game so demanded a simple rule of take the board and flip it in half. So in a two-player game, only half of the board is there. And then players in a t are constantly, indirectly interfering with each other, and you're constantly having to come up with new plans because you moved the elephant I was going to use, and now he's not close enough for me, or whatever it might be. That's what this game needed to be able to really excel as a two-player. I would suspect it would be great family fun at a higher player count. The kids would love all the different animals and all that. But as a two-player game, Fast Loss didn't really land with me and Jen, which is why it's at number 12. Then we have number 11, Flick of Faith. And now this is a game where players are ancient Grecian gods, I think. Uh, maybe Roman gods, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, we're, we're ancient gods, and uh, we are flicking discs out onto a board trying to engage in area control. Uh, we gods are messing with the affairs of mortal men by uh, sending our prophets, by flicking them, to land on different islands so that we can dominate those islands and score points at the end of every round. But the, um, and, and, and the, and the flicking works great. It's sharp. It's fast. Uh, there's a lot of interest because there's different sized discs. You know, the regular little guys, but then bigger guys and really huge ones. You can build temples that are so huge, it's almost impossible for the little discs to move them. Uh, all kinds of fun stuff like that. But what really makes this game special is, at the beginning of every round, two uh, God Decree cards are going to get drawn, or laws, and all players thumbs up or thumbs down simultaneously to determine which of those two laws will come into effect. And these laws can so radically change the game. In silly, goofy ways, like if people vote for it, oh, we have to flick with our eyes closed, um, or we have to use our offhand, or really interesting, compelling gameplay modifying ways, like changing the function of how area control works or whatnot. Every round, there's going to be a new law enacted, and everybody has to agree, you know, again, thumbs up or thumbs down, what they're going to be. And and if, if there's a tie on the vote, then one is chosen randomly. That really elevates this game significantly. And interestingly, I keep talking about my niece and nephew. They actually visited over Christmas, and we did play this game with them. And they had a blast. And we had a blast playing it with them. In fact, it made for a great Christmas gift. Uh, they have now taken it with them, and I know they're continuing to enjoy it. One of the reasons I was ready to let it go is because... Repeat it with me, folks. Again, the two-player implementation of this game was less than ideal. I, I've, I've played this game as a two, three, and four-player game, and you want more people around the table, more people flicking and knocking other people around into the vortex at the center of the board, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, as a two-player game, it's okay, but so much of what makes the game special just disappears. And I think the developers could have done a little bit more work like 
player, each player controls two colors, and you have to score based off your worst colors, something like that. And also, ultimately, the voting, when there's only two players, and I'm going to give it a thumbs up and thumbs down, as often as not, they're resolved by, you know, random. That's less than ideal. It's much more fun when everybody's voting thumbs up or thumbs down, and you can get, um, you know, because these laws will definitely benefit some people more than others, and everybody could argue about, well, he's in the lead, don't let him have that, because that would really benefit him, we all have to vote no, and he says, yes, vote, you know. That stuff gets a lot of fun. Plus, the game comes with eight different special player powers as well that really mix up the game as well. So there is a lot to recommend for Flick of Faith. A uh, really fun, uh, light, romp, atmospheric, party disc flicking game. And just, it doesn't work that well with two, which is why it came in at number 11. But then we move on to number 10, Sanctum. Now, this is basically Diablo, the video game, the board game. I am certain it is inspired by that uh, computer slash video game classic. And this is a race game where everybody is trying to rush across the board and fight monster after monster after monster. Every time you beat a monster, you flip their card over and reveal, oh, this is the upgrade I get. And I'm upgrading my character, getting stronger and stronger. And the way we fight is through basically kind of like a dice worker placement game because all my skills and abilities give me certain dice of different colors and different effects that I can roll. I roll them and uh, you know, and I and I assign them to my different equipment, or or, or or I assign them to the monsters I want to fight. And I might have different color monsters. That means I need different color dice to fight them. And uh, it's the monsters that I choose to attack. As I'm rushing to get to Sanctum, the end of the game where we have to fight the big final boss fight, I am choosing which monsters I basically draft so that they will come and fight me. But by doing that, I'm creating worker placement spots for my dice that I roll every round. And this works great. It's fast, it's fun, it's compelling, and uh, you know the, the leveling up feels really good. And I'm really surprised by this. The ultimate final boss fight when you reach Sanctum is a brilliant gauntlet trial by fire where everybody is trying to fight their way through an incredibly epic final boss fight that not everybody will survive. Some people will get wiped out. And um, it's basically whoever survives the final boss fight could potentially win. It's basically whoever survives with the most health left, who is the least dead, is the winner. And Jen and I were very, very impressed by this game. I'm really surprised a lot of people out there seem to have issues with um, the final boss fight. They think it's anticlimactic, but we thought it was brilliant. Really captures the feel of a, of a constantly evolving and challenging final boss from a video game. Our only problem with the game is... While there are lots of weapons and whatnot you can get, and there's lots of leveling up you can do that, you know, and all the characters have special powers, and you every time you play, you're gonna, uh, you know, create a, choose a different set of powers to focus on on one upgrade path or another. All that stuff's really well well done, but I really think they missed a trick. All the equipment you can get are all variations on uh, the same couple of tricks. They don't really do anything. It's like I was talking about earlier with Little Towns. There's nothing really interesting that is done with the core rules. There are never weapons that say, oh, now that I've got this weapon, it fundamentally changes the way my character works. So the, uh, the getting loot is not as compelling as it could be. And at the same time, while I think, the, if I recall correctly, the game comes with five different characters you can play. And like I said, you could play this game three times in a row with the same character and level that character up differently every time. It's still going to be the same character. And it strikes me as crazy that the developers did not come up with a system where every time I play, I could get a completely new character that is a combination of all kinds of stuff. And then as I play, it won't be the same ranger that I've played so many times. Every time would be like a cool, crazy cross-class character. These are the things that keep it from being upper echelon. This is a sharp game. It is my number 10 of the month, but I would have loved to see a little bit more. And these are the kind of things I hope that publisher CGE could address with an expansion down the road because the core gameplay here in Sanctum is very, very cool. My number 10. Then we have number nine, Aristocracy. And here's the interesting thing about this. This is Reiner Knizia, the doctor of design, working with Tasty Minstrel Games, which is a first. Never seen that before. And uh, he has come up with a very interesting 
Oh, what's the opposite of tile laying? Tile taking game, um, where players are trying to build up the uh, strength of the kingdom as best they can through route building and area control. It, it, it has more than a passing familiarity with some of Reiner Kanichia's other recent. Hey, put tiles on the game to you know grab more. I mean, my heck, going all the way back to through the uh, through the desert. It definitely feels like those kind of games. But the interesting thing is, as part of setup, you completely cover the board with all these tiles that are face down, and on a player's turn, they get to reveal tiles. And slowly, over the course of the game, we reveal more and more and more tiles. And on your turn, you will pick one type of tile on the board and activate it. Um, if it's nobles, that moves forward on the noble track. If it's resources, like force, that gives you resources. I mean, so... And the thing is, the longer the game goes, the more... I mean, on my turn, I'm going to reveal several tiles, but I'm only going to pick one. And that might cascade to several other things. But over time, as more and more players take their turns, they are creating opportunities for other players to take advantage of. And that's really cool. I liked it a lot. My problem, again, is... As a two-player game, the, the system works. It's not faulty, but... With more players between turns, if I was playing a four-player game, there would be three other players who would go before I would get to go again, and that would be three players worth of tiles that are revealed on the board before I get to go again. And um, so more opportunities for me to get big combo chain actions. As a two-player game, I go, then you go, then I go, then you go, so the world doesn't blossom up and develop and evolve as much between turns, and so it makes the game, in Jen's and my experience, as a two-player game, a a little bit luck swingy. One player can get really lucky with stuff being revealed and then the other player, wow, the stuff I need just never comes up because there's only one other player bringing things up. If there were three other players, the chances would be much greater that when it comes back around to my turn, I could trigger the type of stuff I want to do and I would be less subject to just, um, you know, the luck of the draw uh, or the luck of the reveal, basically. And so... I really, it kind of let me down a little bit. I mean, I could see this game really improving for a two-player if there's something like, okay, after my turn, I'm just going to reveal some more tiles, and then after your turn, we're going to reveal some more tiles. So it emulates the feel of a multiplayer game, and that would have really brought uh, Aristocracy up quite a bit. The core gameplay is very good, but seems to be a repeating motif here this month, would be much better at higher player counts. But even still, like I said, the two-player game does work. It's just a little bit more swingy than I'd like because of that. And that's my number nine, Aristocracy. Then we've got number eight, Steamopolis. I've been waiting for this game for years, it feels like. It is from designer Gerhard Hecht, who really came out of nowhere and blew my mind with Kashgar, Merchants of the Silk Road. Such a brilliant engine-building game where you are building three separate engines as three separate decks. It's like you're building three decks in a deck builder all at once and trying to make the decks work together. Kashgar is brilliant. And uh, while Gerhard has done a couple other little smaller games, this is his first really big follow-up game. It's another engine building game like Kashgar, and it is another game that has a brilliant core gameplay mechanism. In this game, it's a steampunk game where I am trying to pressurize steam so to, for two purposes on my turn. I make my steam, I, mean, I, I get build up more steam pressure to uh, to either use that steam to fly higher and higher in the city of Steamopolis so I can do a worker placement, trigger factories, get resources that are all over the place in this city, even do some pickup and delivery. Or I can use that steam to power the uh, the special resource generating and conversion engines that I have installed on my ship. Or I use my steam to do both at the same time. And that's what makes this game so special. That as I pressurize the steam, I've got so many different ways I can do it. I'm building an engine. Am I going to run my engine? Am I going to save all that steam for flying to get to more stuff that'll let me build a stronger engine? And how am I going to do all this as we race to the end of the game? I loved it. The, the, this is such a smart, original engine builder, unlike anything else on the market. My only problem is, this is the third game this month where the core system is brilliant. It is so fun and sharp, but the tools you get to play with that system are a little bit less exciting. I, I mentioned this with, what was it, Little Town and um, uh, Sanctum, where all these upgrades I can get for my engine, they're all variations of get more resources or convert those resources into other resources. At no point in the rulebook for this, or Little Town, or Sanctum, was there ever the need to put in that line of, hey, if you end up drawing a card or a tile that seems like it conflicts with the base rules, follow the 
tile, because none of these upgrades you can get in these games really mix up the game. So, you've got these brilliant core systems that are kind of like you're playing them at an introductory level. And you keep wondering, where's all the really cool tiles? I've made an awesome engine here, but it does kind of standard stuff. I want an awesome engine that I can run that does really cool, amazing things. And so, again, I am hoping Steamopolis catches on because all it needs is an expansion um, so that we can pull more cool, interesting, dynamic stuff into our engine. Now, all that said, uh, Steamopolis still comes in at my number eight because this is such a fresh, different engine, unlike anything else the market has ever seen. Gerhard really knocked it out. It's just so you can make an amazing engine that'll do just standard Euro stuff. I want to make an amazing engine that does amazing stuff. And if it gets an expansion, Steamopolis has the potential to be up there with Kashgar. Merchants of the Silk Road, uh, you know, as like a brilliant follow-up sophomore effort from Gerhard Hecht, who is definitely a designer to watch. So that's number eight, Steamopolis. Then we move on to number seven, Humboldt's Great Voyage. This is a, what do you call it, a Moncala game, where on your turn, there's a bunch of colored discs and all these little depots all around the board. You pick a, a location, say... Uh, Buenos Aires, you grab all the discs out of it, and those discs represent knowledge. I've gone to Buenos Aires because this actually patterns itself after the real um, you know, expedition of Humboldt, which was all about spreading of knowledge throughout the New World. So that's what we're doing. You grab all the discs out of Buenos Aires or uh, Mexico City or wherever, and now, like a regular Moncala, you start dropping those discs off in adjacent spaces in a series uh, to uh, ultimately trigger an effect at the final. This is very Moncala-y. Um, but there's a couple of things that this game does that really changes up the core Moncala formula. One is uh, there are, you, you can't go in any direction you want. You're actually, um, you're really limited. Okay, if I grab this particular area, that means, okay, I can, I've got uh, this branching path, but then I'm just going to keep on following and I know exactly how those dice are going to, or how, how those pieces are going to play out. That's really, really cool because it does address one of the big problems with Moncala style games like Five Tribes in that they can be super analysis paralysis prone when you just have a, a board full of a bajillion options. And when I take these now, I got to put these and I could go in a bajillion different ways. It can really be overloading. Humboldt uh, still gives you a lot of flexibility, a lot of creativity, a lot of freedom for how to use these things as you're Moncala-ing, but it confines you and restricts you so that you're not so overwhelmed and overloaded. I think that's brilliant. But the other thing that makes this game so cool is every disc you have that you would drop off as part of the Moncala action has the potential to generate resources for you. Instead of most Moncala games, they follow the traditional rule that's been with us, humanity, for thousands of years that, oh, you drop a bunch of stuff off and then you only activate the final space. In this game, you could activate all the spaces if you plan correctly. And those two things make this a wonderful Moncala game that's much lighter than I would think most of them are, but Jen, I really enjoyed it a lot for all of its strengths, and it came in at number seven, Humboldt's Great Voyage. Then we go on to number six, Caverna, the Forgotten Folk. Now, I actually covered Caverna a million years ago. Was it 2003 when it originally came out? And, uh, you know, Caverna is basically a fantasy re-implementation of Agricola, which is one of Jen's and my favorite games of all time. Um, and Caverna never really stuck with us as much as Agricola, in large part because it suffered from a, an extreme lack of set of variability. Every time you play Caverna, base Caverna, uh, which is a workplace in a game where players are families of dwarves and, you know, gathering resources, building up their underground home and, you know, foraging out in the forest and all kinds of stuff like that, you know, raising animals, all, you know, getting special powers and all this sort of stuff. Every time you play Caverna, the exact same game awaits you. There's nothing that changes from game to game other than players making different choices. That never sat well with us. Finally, all these years later, Forgotten Folk comes out and it fixes that because as part of setup, uh, what is it? I think there's 30 or 40 some tiles that you know, every time you play in regular Caverna, it's, you're always going to have access to the same tiles. Now, as part of setup, you pull 16 of those tiles out and put in a combination of different new tiles. That means every time you play Caverna, it's going to be a very different set of objectives you can chase after, different opportunities to explore, different combinations. I love it. All the new tiles that are added to this game make this expansion great. But there's, all, there's two halves of it. I love the new tiles and the way you're supposed to work them in. 
The other thing is, every player has the option, instead of being a dwarf, which is kind of now the vanilla race that doesn't do anything special, you can be one of several other fantasy races that have cool strengths and uh, debilitating weaknesses. And so, if you take one of these, instead of just being a regular dwarf, that creates even more setup variability, because, hey, this time, because I am the, uh, oh, the dark ones, that means I don't even want to go outside. I just want to stay underground 100% and really leverage the powers I've got for that, and, and whatnot. So that creates more variety of the game. Now, I do have a complaint about them. The, uh, the, 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 the cool new races... They are, for the most part, there's a few of them that aren't the case, but most of these cool new races give you such clearly established paths to victory that, um, you know, because I've got this power, I have to leverage this power. If I don't leverage this power, I am wasting this character. It can make the game feel a bit samey. In spite of the fact that all these new tiles have come in, it'll feel like, oh, yeah, every time I play the... Um, uh, the, the the mountain dwarves I'm gonna play or the humans I'm gonna do pretty much the same thing game after game after game and that really oh that's a missed opportunity um in in the same it's the exact same problem I talked about with sanctum every time I play a ranger he's gonna be even though he's got some variation within that ranger he's still the same ranger there's nothing variable about him and there's nothing variable about the dark elves or the mountain dwarves or the humans or whatever it might be and that's a missed trick, because while Fo Forgotten Folk fixes our problem with Caverna, it creates another one. And I, it, it's, it's the equivalent, if you're familiar with Agricola, imagine Agricola, where every time you play, you get three, um, you get, uh, you, you have a choice of eight different sets of three occupations, and you will always play as one of those. If you did that, Agricola would feel very samey very quickly. And that's a shame. A few of the races, the Solenoids were an example. I don't remember which. Some of them don't lend themselves to a particular strategy. Uh, they, they just kind of change the way you play, but you could still pursue any type of strategy. If all of the fantasy races had been like that, this would have been a total slam dunk. And don't get me wrong, this is still amazing. If you have Caverna, you must seek Forgotten Folk out. Which is kind of tricky because it's out of print now. But if you can find it, you must get it. It so improves the game. But I mentioned, I mean, it's, hey, it's my number six of the month. I mention all this though because it does not improve a Caverna enough for it to eclipse Agricola's greatness to Jens and my taste. Because of the choice for how the special powers of the unique races were implemented. So it's a little disappointing, but still great. And if you already love Caverna, what do you, well heck, you probably already have it by now because you know about it and it is, it does so many really cool things. My number six, Caverna, Forgotten Folk. Then we move on to number five, Robin of Loxley. Now this was a game that came out 2019 from designer Uwe Rosenberg and it just completely disappeared. What has happened? It used to be a, a new Uwe Rosenberg design was like a major event, but it seems like this is kind of flying under the radar, and it's a shame because it's probably his best design in years. It's a really simple, light, two-player only game where each player has a, a, a Robin Hood, you know, steal from the rich, give to the poor character, that basically moves around a central grid like a knight from chess. Move forward two, over one. Or move over two, forward one. You know, you, you understand the basic knight move. And he is, every turn, hopping around, trying to steal all kinds of goodies from the rich so they can be given to the poor. You have another character, though, that is on the outskirts of this grid. And um, the next space that this other character, your bard, can move move to has a special restriction that says, okay, you can't move here until the Robin Hood character has stolen these types of treasure. Or until, you know, there's various and sundry things. There's a big variety of things. And so what you're trying to do as Robin Hood is bound all over the place, steal things, get into certain positions, you know, relative to the board or relative to your opponent, all kinds of stuff, so that then the bard can move forward because that's how you win the game. If the bard can sing enough songs of your daring do uh, and you can make it to the end of the bard track, you win. So, um, the, 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 the puzzle of moving around to grab all these riches to do basically set collection um, tied with this constantly changing series of objectives you have to do. Because if you can plan really well, you can get your bard to move forward two, three, four spaces in one turn. And that feels so amazing and so powerful if you can get all the right stuff um, by moving your little knight character around. This is sharp. This 
If I did uh, top 10 two-player only games of the year, this would be my number one game of the year. It is amazing. It just misses my top 10 games of the year, period. And like I said, this is the best Uwe Rosenberg design in years. We both love it to pieces. Totally a keeper. My number five, Robin of Loxley. Then we move on to number four, Sprawlopolis. Remember a few years ago, there was this ex after uh, Love Letter, there was an explosion of micro games. You know, games that were basically nothing more than a pack of eight or ten or twelve cards, and yet from just that, you could create these rich, lovely, uh, deep little game experiences. It seems like everybody's forgotten about how cool micro games can be. But not the developers of Sprawlopolis. This is a micro... I think it has 16 cards, if I recall correctly. Which I guess maybe puts it right on the hairy edge. Is it still a micro game? I'm going to think so, because 16 cards and nothing else. For how much depth this game brings, it is basically a SimCity style uh, game. But it is cooperative. As part of setup, uh, you take three of the cards, flip them over to their objective side, because each card has a city grid side and an objective. So every time you play as a group, we have three objectives that are our means for scoring points. And we have to score a certain number of points to win as we build this city. And then we have the rest of the cards. And we're just going to play until we played all the cards out of the deck. And on your turn, you're going to take those cards and you are going to play them to build and expand the city. Putting cards next to each other, stacking cards on top of each other, all trying to complete the three random, the collection of three random objectives that have come out. This game is brilliant. I so wish I had played this a month ago, because if I had, this would have rated very high in my top 10 SimCity-inspired games. It is so good. Um, and I strongly, and apparently it's got a couple of expansions that have already come out, kind of pushing, oh, now you, you know, pushing it maybe beyond the micro game. If you've got like 24 cards, is it still a micro game? I'm not sure. But this game is so brilliant. So much replayability. Every time you play, that combination of three different objectives, so cool and puzzly, and players really do have to work together um, to, to try to complete them. I am blown away by how incredibly sharp Sprawlopolis is. And uh, that's why it's my number four of the month. But hey, we're not done yet. My number three, Cooper Island. Which... Uh, right now is basically my just missed my top 10 of the year. It came in at number 11 when I did my top 10 last week, or was it the week before? I don't know. Time has lost all meaning here in December. Um, but Cooper Island is such a brilliant, heavy, crunchy worker placement euro uh, that, as I talked about before, does some interesting stuff with the worker placement. The worker placement element here is if I'm the first player to go to a particular spot to do a particular action, other players can still go there, but they must pay me. And um, if they don't pay me, they can still go there, but they will suffer a point penalty. They'll lose points instead of paying me. And then I get paid either way. I can take stuff from the general supply, which means I can get exactly what I want. Or if you have to go where I am, then you can pay me and at least you can try to anticipate what I need and don't pay me that. So you're not helping me that much. The worker placement is very sharp, very fun, especially because you have two types of workers. You've got regular workers and you could build a bigger, stronger workforce, or you can upgrade your workers so they become more powerful and you have a smaller workforce, but you can access much more powerful worker placement spots. So the worker placement here is very, very good. But what really makes this game special is the insane combinatorial explosion of free actions you can do on your turn. As the game goes on and you develop your peninsula on this island in the mid-Atlantic, uh, Cooper Island, and you get more opportunities to harvest resources as you explore and build towns and uh, erect statues to your glory and explore more and score points and trigger, um, uh, what do you call it, satellite islands with their special powers. Building new buildings gives you cool special powers you can use and uh, but the the bigger uh, a little civilization you build on this island the more free actions because on your turn all you're going to do is place a worker and do what it says but that's not all you're going to do because uh, usually you're going to trigger two or three or four cool little special bonus freebie actions that will all combine to often make big epic turns and this game is so satisfying when you pull off those big epic turns now there is one weakness the thing that kept it out of the top 10 is as satisfying as it is to make all these big cool epic moments in this very crunchy game that kind of feels almost Vito Lasardish to me um kind of feels in that same wheelhouse. Uh, the uh, For all the work you do, you don't achieve very much. Uh, this is a very low point scoring game, and that feels a little anticlimactic. After I do all this amazing stuff, 
and I got one point for it. And like, oh, in another game, that would have been amazing. That would have been a game-winning turn. And it's it's not the fault of the game that I feel like I'm constantly doing big, amazing game-winning turns, and yet I don't, I, you know, I, I just get kind of meager rewards. It's a minor complaint. But uh, but it is there. But I, on the whole, like I said, that's just what kept it out of my top 10 of the year because it is absolutely amazing. Definitely a game that I look forward to visiting again. I hope it gets expansion content because Cooper Island is the bee's knees. That said, it was number three. Number two is Miyabi. And this game sadly arrived at my door the day after I filmed my top 10 of the year. If it had arrived a couple days earlier and Jen and I had gotten to play it, it would have made my top 10. Um, which then would have turned Cooper Island in my number 12 of the year instead of number 11. But, so suffice to say, folks, when this, in April 2020, I revisit my top 10, because I will have played a bunch more 2020 games, and I'll have a more definitive final list of best of the year, fully expect to see Miyabi there. I, I can't imagine anything that brings it out, because this is the latest design from Michael Kiesling, who is fast becoming one of my favorite designers of all time. This is a tile lane game kind of similar at first glance to his earlier Sansushi, but the thing that makes this game special is you are so restricted in what you can do for your tile lane because um, every tile has a feature on it, whether it's bushes or koi ponds or what have you, that determine what row you can put that tile in. And once you put a tile in a given column, that column is closed off and you cannot uh, put any more features into that column. Those two simple rules create such an insanely tense and challenging and rewarding puzzle that you have to work your way through over five rounds. I can't recommend this enough. This is the best tile laying I've seen since um, Habitats or... Oh, what do you call it? Santa Maria. It's that good. But the core game is so simple. And actually, the game comes with several modules. Jen and I, we find we enjoy it if we turn all the modules on. But if you leave all the modules off, this is a very light, family-friendly gateway game that you could play with uh, board game novices. But if you play with all the stuff turned on, oh, it is so rich, so satisfying, so much fun. Uh, my number two of the month. And I forget, I think it'd be my number seven of the year, if I recall correctly, uh, when I figured it out. Uh, Miyabi. And my number one which is also my number one best game of the year, save the best for last, came in right under the wire, Maracaibo, which is a uh, Pirates of the Caribbean without fantasy stuff, so it's just more adventure on the high seas style Euro. Um, and it's a rondelle game where every round, or over multiple rounds, we are racing through the Caribbean, always going clockwise. There's a few branching paths on the rondelle, but this is a race because everybody is going as fast as they can to hit all the important ports of call because once some player makes it to the end of the rondelle, that round is over for everybody. So, if I make a lot of really big moves and get there before you can get to the island you want, well, you can see I'm going for it and you feel a lot of pressure. Are you going to skip over several islands so that you can get there to where you need to go before I end the round? Um, that is the core conceit that this whole game revolves around and it's brilliant. Uh, because rondelles normally are fairly slow and stately affairs. Generally, in a rondelle game, you can move one, two, or three spaces, and if you want, you can then spend resources to move more. That's kind of the rule as laid down by Matt Gertz back in the day, and it's pretty much what rondelle games do for the most part. This game says, uh-uh, this ain't your grandpappy's rondelle, this ain't your Matt Gertz rondelle. In this game, the rondelle is significantly bigger, and you can move up to seven spaces. That gives you so much freedom, and the game actively encourages you to move farther. So, uh, because if, if the farther you move when you land in a village, the more bonus actions you get to unlock. Uh, so, you're definitely encouraged to move the full seven spaces. And if there's a player doing that so they can get all those bonus actions, like I said, they are going to end the round very quickly before other players who are going slow and steady, like a turtle's pace, before they can get to anything. And that trade-off, you know, it is. It's the tortoise and the hare. Fast, get to what you need, or slow and steady. But in this game, um, the the tortoise, the, the hare, definitely has the advantage. I love it. And if all that weren't enough, the game comes with, I don't know, the stack of cards must be at least four inches dick, so, or thick. <laughs> so many cool special powers that you can unlock every single time you play. So much variety. Kind of almost a terraforming Mars in that regard. And every time you play, you're going to get a different collection of stuff. And if all that weren't enough, this is from designer Alex Fister. 
Alexander Pfister, and this is his best implementation to date of bringing narrative, story-driven gameplay into what would could be considered a dry, soulless Euro. Uh, you play through 11 chapters, and the storyline has branching paths, it has characters who you meet, and then they become characters you can play in the game, all kinds of stuff. It works so wonderfully. It's my be It's the best game of the year. It is, as far as I'm concerned, Alexander Pfister's best game to date. It supplants Great Western Trail and Isle of Sky and Mombasa, his previous high watermarks. Maracaibo is amazing. I love it to pieces. I, you know, hey, I, and I love Pirates of the Caribbean. I, you know, I love a swashbuckling buccaneer style tale. Normally, these types of games are very Ameritrash and all about players trying to attack each other and sink each other's ship. But here, we are just racing as fast as we can to get what we need to complete objectives, and it's awesome. Uh, my number one game of the month and of the year, Maracaibo. And that's it, folks. That was, uh, what was it, 18 new games. And we'll be back in the new year. And uh, Jen and I will have played a bunch more games, and I will round them up for you. Toot sweet. But in the meantime, come back on January 1st, and I'll have my um, top most anticipated games for 2020. I'm working on that list right now, and it's already looking like 2020 is going to be amazeballs. So, uh, look for that soon, and otherwise, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.